In order to be so bold and courageous as to stand out from the crowd and endure the inevitable scorn and persecution that comes with that, Christians need to have a strong certainty in their faith. The stronger in faith we are, the more bold and courageous we will be. You don't put yourself on the line for something you don't really believe in. So how do we grow in certainty? By hearing the word of God and then being obedient to what we hear. The rhythm of true Christian discipleship is a tidal motion of being drawn in to be taught and then being sent out to apply. Hear, apply, hear, apply, hear, apply. That's how Jesus did it and that's how we should do it. And as we go through this process, the truth about God is revealed and we come to know it more deeply and with more conviction, both intellectually and experientially. Christians who are truly growing in faith are growing in certainty because, as the Bible tells us, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. As we grow in faith, we grow in conviction or certainty, and as we grow in certainty, we grow in courage. You'll notice then that Christians who are truly following Christ start to leave the world behind. They're no longer enamoured with it, and they're unashamed about that. They are increasingly willing to stand for God's truth and increasingly willing to endure the taunts and the pressures. They will suffer the loneliness, the hatred and the misunderstanding as Jesus himself did. They will refuse to abandon God for the sake of popularity and will be happy to be made distinctive by their divergence from the world around them and by their adherence to a higher moral code. They are going through a process that Christians know as sanctification, and as they move in this direction, they will bring increasing light and liberty into their society, but often at great personal cost. When a Christian makes a moral decision, there is really only one thought going through their minds, only one reference point they are looking to, and that is God. Christians are always internally regulating their behaviour by using him as the fixed reference point on their moral compass. They're always asking themselves the famous question, what would Jesus do? They don't care about what is culturally acceptable or politically correct, and they don't follow crowds or fads or trends of the day. The world's views on abortion may change, but Christians only look to God and he never changes. The world's views on homosexuality may change, but Christians only look to God and he never changes. They are always only looking to God. They're willing to be different and persecuted for that. They trust God's goodness and understand his moral law never changes. They know that he himself is the dividing line between right and wrong. Therefore, if what we're doing aligns with his will, then we're in the right. And if what we're doing contradicts his will, then we're in the wrong. It's as simple as that. He is our benchmark, our perfect standard. He is the good apple by which we measure bad apples and the absolute light by which we measure darkness. We can be certain about it. As you can see, this kind of moral certainty creates a very black and white way of thinking, as highlighted by our trusty diagram. God's moral law defines what's right and wrong. It's solid and it's rigid, it's black and white, and it never changes. All we have to do is live by its boundaries and we can't go wrong. It's that simple and we can be that certain about it. And although it's unpopular to say it these days, let me say that certainty is good. The diagram how you see it is how it should be. There are real moral absolutes in this world and God is rightly the arbiter between the two. Martin Luther once said, Nothing in the world causes so much misery as uncertainty. And he was right. Look around and you'll see that the world without God is indeed a very uncertain and tumultuous place and it does cause stress and misery. People out there are not having a good time. But it's fair to say that the opposite is also true. That the solid and dependable certainty that comes from a growing faith automatically leads to increased peace, confidence and security in life. All of which are fundamental to that deep-seated joy that should be the hallmark of all those who trust in Jesus. This peace, confidence and security that Christians enjoy riles godless people because it's something they just don't have. They hate the idea of a fixed moral law. They hate the idea that they could be on the wrong side of it and they hate that Christians are so certain about it. Non-believers hate our certainty. They don't want fixed boundaries. They don't want this God interfering with their lives. They want the license to do whatever they want. So they claim that moral certainty is closed-minded, bigoted and arrogant and that no one has any right to believe in anything so wholeheartedly. They instead glorify their own uncertainty and restlessness as being noble and enlightened. 
They don't mind discussion as long as no one claims to have the absolute truth on a subject, as long as no one tries to tell them that they're wrong about anything. Everything must remain subjective and relative and unfixed. Everything must remain undefined and open to the interpretation of the individual because remember, each person is their own god with their own truth under the satanic system. So godless people live in a world of undefined and variable shades of grey where they can bend the moral law to suit their own selfish whims and they simply hate black and white truths that could expose that selfishness or bother their consciences. These are the hallmarks of our confused, aimless and uncertain postmodern era who refuse to submit to God in favour of following their own egocentric and licentious whims. They do it under the banner of tolerance, but this word is just a euphemism for selfishness. Tolerate my actions roughly translates as, let me do whatever I want to do without making me feel guilty about it. Their trading of God for self means extreme uncertainty. They don't know what they're living for or where they're going when they die. They don't know what means anything or if anything means anything at all. They don't know what to believe in. They have no reference point. They are lost in a moral void of hedonistic emptiness. No wonder such uncertainty brings so much misery. And so the world is restless for meaning, but meaning apart from God. They want inner peace and calm, but they don't want God to figure in the equation. In order to find peace for their souls, they become easily blown about by every wind of new teaching that comes along, claiming to offer some hope and comfort, and are easily influenced by anyone who claims to have some spiritual insight or moral direction. This expresses itself in New Age spiritual fashions or trends, whether it be for Feng Shui, Yoga, Mantras, Kabbalah, Reiki, Astrology, Acupuncture, or any number of other fads. The common denominator in all New Age spirituality is that it's self-centered and often about trying to find the God or Goddess within. People go to and fro on these things, following the crowds, the media, the pop stars, the magazine columnists, and other streams of popular culture. These spiritual fads that don't include God always end up at pagan occultism. God describes it better than I can when he says, Those who reject me are like the restless sea which is never still but continually churns up mud and dirt. There is no peace for the wicked. People are restlessly looking for things that will help them make sense of life and which will give them certainty without reference to God or his binding moral law. They want a form of calming spirituality. They just don't want one that will make rigid moral demands of them. They want something that makes them feel good without asking them to be good. In doing so, they just churn up egocentric pagan dirt from the laboratories of hell. So here's the stark contrast. We have Christians on one side who are growing in faith and certainty and the world on the other side becoming ever more uncertain and miserable and who are letting this drive them towards New Age occultism. And this is just one more reason why it's the mission of the Christian to wade into the darkness to shine a real light of hope, to keep confronting people with the truth that they'd rather not see and to keep bringing people back to God and his moral law with all its rigidity and solidity and hope and peace and certainty and joy. I remember I once had a conversation with a non-Christian friend about theft. But ah, she said, what if the thief is homeless and starving and the person they steal from is a millionaire and wouldn't even miss the money? Now that's a tricky one, isn't it? There are no moral absolutes. What's moral changes based on the circumstance. And then she sat back triumphantly having said this, as though she had successfully created a grey area in the issue of theft. She actually seemed pleased that she'd created a moral loophole by which people may rightfully steal from one another. Like we should rejoice that we can now selfishly take things from others if we could convince ourselves that we needed it more than the owner. I wondered if she'd still be as pleased if a thief stole from her. I wonder if she'd thought through what kind of world she was trying to create where everyone could do what thou wilt based on their own self-centred moral worldview. And this is how the world begins to work without God though. There's a push to make everything uncertain and open to interpretation. Now fortunately for decent society, she hadn't created any loophole at all. She hadn't come close. God's morals are absolute. They are certain. Do not steal. Just don't do it. There's no ways around it, there's no room for negotiation, it's black and white, it's very simple and very certain. 
We only try to manipulate God's morality and create grey areas when we don't like what God's morality has to say. And as soon as we come out from submission to God and start asking, does God really say, we are moving into Satanism. It sounds sensationalistic, I know, but these are really the only two paths in life. You have God's way and Satan's way. So Christians really have very few moral dilemmas. Sure, we sometimes struggle to do the right thing and we sometimes wish the moral law could be more flexible like everyone else, but we have a clear definition from God of what the right thing is and we know it's not up for debate. The moral law is never for us to define, only to live by. And not even perfectly, it has to be said. We still make mistakes. But we know that doing the right thing matters a great deal and that God watches us at all times. So when we make mistakes, we repent, we get back up again, and we try again. So morally, Christians are rarely confused. But I'll tell you where Christians do get confused. They get confused in the less well-defined, pliable, bendy realm of the left-hand side of our diagram, the neutral side. We have much to learn about that side, so that's what we're going to look at in the next section of this series.